Well, hello, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you might be, and welcome to another edition of the Alliance Against Seclusion and Restraints live interview and presentation series. Uh, my name is Guy Stevens. Really excited to have you here today. We've got a great show uh, in store for you today. In fact, uh, just just finished the the pre-show discussion, and and we were having so much fun that uh, I almost forgot to join in here. So we've got a lot to talk about today. Uh, of course, the Alliance Against Seclusion and Restraint is an organization that's dedicated to changing minds, laws, and policies uh, around the practices of restraint and seclusion to reduce and eliminate these practices from across the nation and really beyond. Uh, our ultimate vision is to see safer schools for students, teachers, and staff. And I will share, there's some good news on the horizon today. The Keeping All Students Safe Act was reintroduced today. Uh, so check out our website. And in fact, I can share with you uh, real quickly here, um, that on our website, we've got some information about the Keeping All Students Safe Act. So there's an article that you can read and I uh, would encourage you to find out more because we're going to want to support that as we're moving forward. So with that said, I am very excited today to have a special guest. Professor Andrew McDonald will be joining us actually from the UK. So we're, we're working across time zones here uh, for a very special interview and we will be taking your questions. So I hope you're ready with some questions during the interview. So if you have questions, feel free to post those in the chat. We'll be looking at them as they um, are posted and try to ask questions as they come. Also to let you know, uh, this is always a popular question. Today's event will be recorded. We're gonna make this available on Facebook, YouTube, and as an audio podcast. So if you're not able to watch the whole thing right now, you will be able to go back and watch it later. So let me begin by introducing our co-host. And again, our co-host today is Beth Tolley. So Beth is our Director of Educational Strategy at the Alliance Against Seclusion and Restraint. She retired in 2018 from a leadership position in Virginia's lead agency for early interventions of infants and toddlers. Although retirement has not been what she thought, we've been putting her back to work and she's got lots of work still to do. But she has experience as a parent, a grandparent, and, and uh, you know, of, of working with people who have children, who have had you know, behavioral challenges, which has fueled her passion for really improving the lives of children and their families through education, mutual support, and advocacy. So as always, Beth, welcome and excited to have you here. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. So we've got a very special guest and you and I just got to spend a little time talking to him before we started here. Um, so I wonder if you would do us the privilege of introducing Professor McDonald. So let me go ahead and bring him up and add him to our stream here. Okay, yes, thank you. And I'm gonna read it so I get it right. <laughs> Uh, Professor Andrew McDonald's new practitioner guide really is a reflective journey. I'm going to put this up so you can see it. Ooh, can we see that? Um, a strong theme throughout the chapters is that we must look at our own behavior first in order to manage highly stressful situations. And that just resonates so much with me. Um, so he is he has a bachelor's in science, a master's in science, and a PhD. And he's a consultant clinical psychologist and the director of Studio 3 Clinical Services. He's the director, clinical consultant, and team leader for Studio 3 Training, and was formerly the clinical psychologist to Monty Hall, I, I may have said that wrong, That's okay. correct, correct me on anything, Hospital Birmingham. And he has a particular interest in the design of community settings for people who challenge, and extensive experience working with service users with a learning disability or uh, autism who self-harm. I am so thrilled to have you on the show. And please say anything more that I may have missed. I think that's that's fine, Beth. I mean, uh, I suppose the only other thing I've collected is I'm a visiting professor of autism studies at the small university called Birmingham City University. So um, a bit of an all-rounder. Um, you know, I think to myself as, maybe a practitioner academic in that kind of way of looking at things. And my life's work has been about really making uh, restraint elimination a reality. And it's been quite an interesting journey. So I'm really right. honored to be have the opportunity to speak to you guys tonight. So. That's great. Uh, thank you so much. We're, we're so excited to have you here today. And I know you and I have had the opportunity to have a couple mm -hmm. conversations, which is, has absolutely been fantastic uh, to learn about the work that you're doing and the approach that you're taking. Uh, you know, we, we've really been inspired and uh, really excited to, to share you with the, um, the audience we have here at the Alliance Against Seclusion and Restraint. So thank you so much for, for joining us. And we're, we're ready to grill you with some questions. Grill away. All right. Sounds Mildly good. Grill. We'll start and, with that first. And, and I will say that anybody in the audience is welcome to bring up questions. You you already have a fan. Uh, Pam said that she's so excited to be here and to see Dr. Andy. So you you already have a fan have here it. in our in our midst. Uh, but let's start with some questions. So 
Uh, you mentioned, and, and I know that you are very committed to eliminating practices like restrained seclusion. Uh, can you give us a little history? I mean, how did you become involved in this work? And, and... Uh, yeah, it's it's kind of a, I'll, I'll try and keep it concise as okay. I've spoken a couple of times. I know conciseness and me don't go together necessarily as bedfellows, <laughs> but I'm gonna try my best. Um, I started off originally working in a, a behaviorally based service before I trained as a psychologist, uh, where we did some pretty kind of full on stuff in the 80s, squirting lemon juice in people, taught mm. some things that they called restraint. Um, did my professional training at Birmingham University as a clinical psychologist, but I was going through a little bit of a major life change from my point of view. I kind of got sucked up into the human rights movement in terms of mostly people with intellectual disabilities that I, the time that I work with and also with some people with autism. Um, and really, I got into this area by accident. I, I was asked to attend a training course as a trainee psychologist on something called managing violence. With hindsight now, you know, <laughs> in a training course like that, there are going to be some problems. I attended this course. I thought I was quite respectful. Um, the two instructors who were full of testosterone, it's the only way I would describe it, they got some gym mats out after about 20 minutes of conversation and started to show the moves. Um, so that's two days of a living hell as far as I was concerned. And for people who don't know me, I probably always had a few anger issues myself. So I managed to contain myself. So at the end of the training, uh, one of the instructors said, I'm a national instructor in a particular training system. Uh, I can see you're a psychology trainee. Well, obviously, uh, let me show you a few more things around the physical things we teach. And I said, that's fine. I'm a black belt in the martial art of jiu-jitsu. And while you're on the subject, I think you guys are dangerous. And I think what you're teaching has no rationale, no basis. There's no audience here. Went back and told my boss at the time at Money Hill Hospital, name the names, at a certain hospital. And he said, well, <laughs> the message from the management is design something different. So I got involved, first of all, by thinking, what's the research out there? More full eye on crisis management. And in 19, today, 1986, you could say 87, you could put it in a thimble. Now you could put it in maybe three thimbles, if you want an analogy, possibly even a whole half mug. I know you use cups in your bakery <laughs> measure. So maybe a half cup in the analogy. <laughs> so my original idea was, well, let's design some training. Let's try and evaluate it. It turned into a nightmare. Um, we got lots of training requests. And I was very uncomfortable that the training that we were doing was evolving. Um, and maybe we weren't that confident in whether what we were doing was a big deal or not. So by the time we got to the mid-90s, we formed Studio 3 as an organization, really just partly to protect what we were doing. Um, and then it evolved from there, really. It kind of steamrolled slightly out of control, particularly in certain sectors. Um, academically, I kind of did 80% of my doctorate on staff training in physical interventions. Lovely subject. Uh, decided I didn't like any of the studies, which is if you're an academic, you shouldn't like the studies you produce yourself because you can see all the flaws in them. Mm -hmm. um, and I left it like most people do, became my practitioner psychologist. I just abandoned it for maybe a couple of years. And then I got contacted by a wonderful professor at the University of Birmingham who said, you are also an honorary member of staff. So um, uh, you can have an extension on your completion rate. And at the time, I thought, I don't want one. So I went in deliberately petulantly to create a situation which is what most good psychologists do you engineer a situation to get the result you want the result i actually thought about was him saying you're out of time forget it and this man that i barely knew said i understand from a number of my colleagues that this is 80 percent done so i'm writing you an unprecedented extension they actually said as well that um, there had been a, a problem and they'd lost a lot of original files of members of staff's PhDs. So he said, so actually, you, we could register you now if you want. So I completed that around 2005. It was a living hell. I, I loathed trawling through every published study I could find and unpublished that had the word physical in it, restraint, mm -hmm. seclusion, and training. This is the important thing, mm -hmm. training. And that, people talk about evidence base. Um, I think in the first review... We came out of about 100 studies, of which about 12 would meet any kind of rigor, um, of which maybe six from that level of, of in, in investigation would be any good. And this year, in 2020, um, partly because of COVID and partly because of pressure from our young team at Studio 3, that um, we're updating the literature review right now. It'll be updated relevant to January 2020. And I have to say, thimble to a cup 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And And it's a fundamental problem we have. We have a multi-billion dollar industry in terms of crisis management training with no evidence base. You might as well be looking at a car lot, to be blunt. Sure. Can, can I ask you a question on that? Kind of, and, and uh, thinking about the evidence-based, uh, you know, ideology that's out there, um, one of the one of the deficits from that that I found and, and that we found is that oftentimes that evidence doesn't include the impact that it has on the people that it is being used on, or the populations being used. So, you know, taking certain practices that to uh, you know someone with autism may in fact be very difficult or even feel abusive. So, I mean, how how do you reconcile those things with I think, I, think it, I think it's actually very easy to reconcile because in North America is the same in Europe. Mm-hmm. Evidence base has become politicized to mean one particular methodology. Mm-hmm. So the inquiry of me talking to you now would not be evidence based under a narrow definition, which is rubbish. Your accounts are equally valid as me controlling variables scientifically about the outcomes of training. So. My, one of my first studies, it's always interesting, the studies I'm most proud of probably had the least impact. And I published an article about the social validity of restraint methods. That was in 1998. Uh, and then I included a study on asking consumers about, look at these methods, which do you like? And they all went, well, we don't like any of them, but there are some we seem to think are okay-ish. But they didn't say they were wonderful. And at the time, I developed this chair restraint method, which we actually abandoned eventually. The main reason is because staff liked it too much. You know, you're not designing a method to say, look, isn't it great that you're not holding someone on the floor anymore? You're still restraining someone. So the logic was the role of consumers became a passion for me. And actually, I'm very lucky that probably around that period of my change empirically was I didn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. But actually, um, I remember even for my thesis, I struggled with where am I going to put the accounts of people uh, around this? But it is data. So. I think square in a circle is quite easy because there's a lot of bit I'd like to make on that guy, which is that we're not dealing with an experimental variable called restraint that's in a laboratory somewhere like Mm. the Moderna vaccine waiting to be tested in a trial. People are being restrained right now. So the technology is already out there and it's very dodgy, the technology. There's not a great evidence base. So you've also got a moral part of research to say, well, let's try and get the best evidence we can in these areas. Would agree with that. But we have a problem about waiting for 10 years for the great randomized control trial that's going to sort Mm. everything out, which it won't, because actually these are things happening to people right now. So I think when you take a triangulated approach, which says experimental evidence that manipulates variables, which we all know, you know, right the way through to accounts of individuals, right the way through to the wonderful thing that your organization does as well, which is bringing to people's people's awareness and not just necessarily just the awful area of restraint related deaths, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but other areas too. I mean, Mm -hmm. one example, I, we, in, 2004, I, I kind of, with another training organization, actually, we decided we wanted to campaign to ban something from the rich freight industry. And I said to a colleague, I'm up for banning something. And he actually said at the time, what do you want to ban? I went, I'm not sure I care at one level at the moment. Let's ban something. Let's make an attempt and attack <laughs> the training industry in the UK. So we actually wrote a charter saying we wanted to ban prone restraint. We couldn't decide what to call the charter, which we wrote in 20 minutes. And the idea was, we'll put this online. It's great. All these people who are campaigners will sign up and sign it and we'll pressure government. Actually, very few people signed up online. Mm-hmm. The people who did tended to leave a lot of hostile comments. They were mostly anonymous from the training industry. There was mm-hmm. quite a lot of those. You know, somebody's going to die somewhere was one of my favorite. I think it was our growth in Scotland. They're going to die if you remove this tool from the toolkit. Mm-hmm. But what actually happened was the political agenda with it I can now say with hindsight, it's a small thing we did, but it actually did move the agenda a little bit. So what actually happened was the Millfield Charter, we called it, and you can find it online and the articles about it, was um, actually we had more trouble with the name than writing the charter. Hmm. And the name was actually the hotel we were meeting in that evening because we just could not decide on the name. I went outside and said, it's called the Millfield Hotel. You want to call it a charter? Call it that. I'd like to say it was more sophisticated. But what it also meant was we were campaigning about this. We've just had an audit of, um, as you know, from CQC in this country about people with autism in hospitals. And um, there were some lots of negative things in there. But one glimmer was they can barely find in autism disability services now the routine use of prone restraint in training courses and programs. Mm -hmm. So we're getting close to a sector specific Mm. ban. But 
I, I mention it as an example because you can't do this work unless you're campaigning as well. You know, right, right. we started off with the same logic, which is that, you know, um, we have to upset the apple cart. Mm -hmm. We have to turn a ship around like a super tanker to say you're going in the wrong direction. Right. Yeah. Y you brought up something interesting, which is the the argument we sometimes hear, which is, oh, gee, you, you can't take that away. You can't take these yeah. tools away because somebody's mm -hmm. going to get hurt. And and all the data that we've seen, and I'm, I'm curious about your experience, you know, being someone that has a, you know, yeah. a history in this, but all the data that we've seen really indicates that you're, you're much more likely to see an injury to a student or a teacher or staff member in a school context. Or, and we can carry that over into other contexts, but you're much more likely to see an injury when restraints and seclusions are being used. Absolutely. It, yeah. That's the other data that you don't collect as well is people getting injured on training courses. Uh, it's, a oh, whole, that's interesting. it's a whole area. Now you can make your training course so safe that it's sanitized. Right. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, please don't move too fast. Let me show you how somebody lies on the ground and I hold them. But there's actually quite a lot of training now that's been so, it's so disingenuous, it doesn't reflect the real world. So when those staff leave there with their, training that's not really re right. realistic and fit for purpose they get hurt they've even got a better chance of getting hurt because they've right. not practiced these things under these conditions the other side about training is is that um if you train people in the last res in last resort it becomes the first result Restored. my colleague roy devoe exactly. and i are about this so you still have to train people in the toolkit but there are other challenges we face with this an example in schools um if you want to teach someone to regulate who's melting down and who's distressed they're going to break things. So you don't restrain someone for breaking objects. You you evacuate a room. You use mm -hmm. planned escape. You may have to physically disengage a pupil from another pupil. That's fine. It's not great. But you're going to have to allow a low demand environment. And you're also going to have to allow property destruction. In UK schools here, for example, it's still ambiguous. I still come across incidences where restraints are used because property was being damaged. They don't say that in the report, but that's what they mean. We've right. just had this new fancy whiteboard and we couldn't let Johnny smash that. Yeah, so you all ended up well-intentioned idiots, we call it in Ireland. You all piled in, all frightened and scared. He's frightened and scared too. QED, people get injured. And I think we found this with a piece of work I was involved with called an expert panel approach, which they're now coming back to, where we looked at methods because at the time I was interested in it as a niche area. So actually some methods are more dangerous than others. And what I got mm -hmm. back all the time was, well, there's no evidence. No, no some methods are more dangerous than others. Yeah. If I hold your arms up your back and I slip, you're going to hit the ground really, really hard, which has actually happened to me in the early days when I was taught this nonsense. You know, mm -hmm. I remember that. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I so was worried about it is, is that that staff injury bit is if the, if the injury rate on a training course in crisis management, the teacher's train is really low. Don't see that as always a good result because it might also tell you they're not training. You might as well show someone a PowerPoint if you're going to do something. I mean, right, if the right. fire service turned around and said, we'll just show you a PowerPoint about how to get into fires and approach here's the fake you'd flames, say, right? Here's, here's the flames. Here's the right, fake right, bit. Right, Ooh, right, somebody, right. You'd say that was crazy. Right, right. But we've got a two-tier approach in the training industry where people are either, you know, I, I know for a fact there was a study done in the UK quite a few years ago, it's very old now, in psychiatric nursing, where they surveyed psychiatric nurses in one service and 31% of them said that they'd received some kind of minor injury on a training course. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. that was really cool outrage and people said it's much lower. And I said at the time, well, what's a good number? A good number is actually zero or close mm -hmm. to it. It's not a it's not a better number if only 5% of people said their shoulders were injured or they were hurt. So that one of the areas to look at in the data that you guys are campaigning for, and I would advise strongly, is, is actual data collected on the training in crisis management, whatever mm. uh -oh. systems well, well. they are okay. themselves, right? Mm -hmm. so that data tells you not as well. Mm -hmm. You cannot teach prone restraint, for example, or even supine and holds face down. I, I don't believe in, sorry, I should have said to your audience, I'm not a big fan of either of them. We haven't taught any of them for years. When I started the campaign with my colleagues about prone restraint, I wasn't that keen on supine either. We just thought we'd give a focus. Right, As one right. of my colleagues said at the meeting, you got guys don't teach any of that stuff, do you? No, we don't. We do yeah. a little bit of what you might call dancing around the room. We do a little bit of disengagement. We actually let go of people before they're calm which is another mm -hmm. thing in the area of restraint decompression. If you hold someone and they've got to be, quotes calm before you let go of them, you're not teaching any regulation whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. for example, I'll just tell you an example the other week clinically with a young man who's been restrained, pretty much traumatized, and it's become a ritual to be restrained on the ground. 
my colleagues have taken over their training and we've had to put some, quote, coaches on the ground. You can't just teach people this in a classroom all the time. And one thing straight away was they said he keeps pulling us to the ground into this familiar posture that he doesn't like. It's true. <laughs> So basically, we had to say, well, actually, what you're going to do is we're going to teach you how to disengage from the hold as he's pulling you literally on top of him because mm. it's become part of the ritual. And my colleague rang up and he was trying to not laugh. And he said, I shouldn't laugh. But he said, the teacher looked at me like I discovered the Rosetta Stone. Mm. She went, that's a good idea. Yeah, we could do that, couldn't we? It's called um, restraint. So, so, so Beth, let me bring up a question from a, a viewer real quick and then we'll get okay. to yours. Um, but you know, more of a comment here, but it's, it's talking about how it's not just the physical intervention that results, you know, it's, it's trauma. I mean, they mentioned the mental harm. And of course, the thing that, that we know is that, you know, when, when you traumatize somebody through restraining and secluding them, you know, in essence, what you are doing are, is probably making it more likely they're going to be hypervigilant in the future and need to be restrained and secluded again. Um, so that's a great point. Any thoughts on that? I, I know these guys, there is no even point in me trying to debate it. It's true. And it's as true. All, all kinds of interventions when people are hypervigilant are going to have traumatizing properties. And that's both ways. And I keep saying this. It's also for not every member of staff is some monster who wants to go out there and do this. But it fuels that trauma cycle. And that's why I would take it even a layer back. Some of the crisis management strategies we use, raising our voice, mm. being firm with people. Mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. Kids who've been victims of abuse and adults re-traumatizes them with the very act of it. Yeah. And I think one of the examples that we have with this, and it's absolutely right, is that these are not neutral, emotionally neutral interventions, and we mustn't intellectualize it too much. And I thank them for that comment because I kind of know of them, you guys, and you know where I stand on it. You know, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, we're going to eliminate this stuff if we have the will. Um, it's a bit like the whole idea of climate change. You know, can we really get rid of greenhouse gases if we really decide we want to? Yes, we can. It does involve resources. It does involve a systemic approach of which training is a tiny part. But yes, so I, I would agree with them heartedly. So, yeah, I was going to say it's a huge mindset. And and what do I hear bird? Um, so what? Can somebody I, ask the phone. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So, yeah. so no Somebody answer the phone. <laughs> um, so what I see in training is a misunderstanding of um, creating a Hello, safe. Sweet, I'm live. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my angel. Mon listen, chéri. That, that always reminds me to take my, my phone away. He forgot this You've now put me at serious <laughs> risk of harm. <laughs> Uh -oh. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, well this is being recorded. So we'll have any we'll have any uh any evidence necessary. Yeah. Okay, so here's here's what yeah. I see. I see a misunderstanding in prevention versus de-escalation. Yep. All this talk about people who say, Oh yeah, we're listening to the science, we're listening to you. So we're gonna teach prevention, and what they teach is de-escalation, yeah. forgetting the fact that the adults are often what de-escalates either because they take offense at what a child said, a student said, or because they don't recognize a child who is in a, a state of fear, and, and they take uh, a child's refusing to do something, which is really a freeze response, and they escalate it. And that is not, de-escalation is not prevention. But it's, it is the point about it, which is that when they think they're de-escalating, de-escalation should be to have a calming influence on someone. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you're absolutely right. Something like two thirds of all incidents that I've ever worked with in my career are triggered in, inadvertently and sometimes deliberately by staff, carers, parents, and myself. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. Look at what's just happened here. I, my <laughs> attempt at humor in this house might well put me at risk later on tonight. Yeah. <laughs> I will pour my wife a glass of gin later and say, I'm sorry for my sarcasm. That wasn't my intention. She knows it is. The point about it is, is that when we write plans or we analyze behavior, we're analyzing the wrong people's behavior all the time. Mm -hmm. We're analyzing the kids or the adults as well, like they're in some kind of analytical behavioral nightmare goldfish bowl. When actually the largest agent in this is us. And actually in a confrontation, and, and I've the other criticism I get a lot is, you know, what does he know about the real world? Well, you know, I've I kind of had quite a high ACES score. I've kind of been through the university of life. Yeah. I've been on the receiving end of what they call a hiding in my time. Something to do with having a big mouth. I think that was a factor in most of them. But <laughs> And righteous indignation and campaigning. But the point about it is, is that somebody's got to back down to mm -hmm. deal. 
and that has to be us right we have to allow people to escape without thinking it's about winning and losing and that is also excellence in de-escalation but then it spills into prevention to use your term as well beth because if you create a culture where people are almost naturally doing that mm -hmm. even in a rubbish environment as i'd like to say that's overcrowded you can still do quite a lot by how you communicate with people and i'm i'm privileged to think about a load of people from ross green mona de la hook others mm -hmm. laurie dessa tells i wouldn't put myself in their company but a lot of us share a very similar belief system and the belief system is about the fact that I am an active participant. I am not an observer. And I think that's one of the key things around crisis management that when we do our training, for example, people find our de-escalation training difficult because we're asking them to reflect. And that's why I call my book The Reflective Journey. We're asking them to bear their soul and say, we're not perfect. Think of the time you've raised your voice to your kid. Have you ever been ashamed of something you've done like that? I mean, the litany goes on. Let's not sanitize people around this area. But if we avoid de-escalation and say, well, we should engineer situations where we never need it, that's not going to help either. De-escalation and good de-escalation means no restraint, right? It means strategic capitulation. It means <laughs> having planned responses. You know, I sometimes have empathy for people who say, well, I had to hold this kid once. Once you might be that everyone was melting down and in crisis. Yeah, your limbic system's overheating. You can use polyvagal theory if you like more than once becomes a systematized response and a justification mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Kid yeah, I, down the road once fine i get it i might i had to do it with my own kid once but then i taught him how to cross the road i right. didn't actually just then say well every week i just got to get used to the fact that my son will run out into the road right, right. what i'm doing is right it's, yeah. it's really stupid uneducated logic if you really want to put it <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, you know, Ross Green would put that. Uh, Are we live now? Maybe that was too blunt. No, <laughs> you're good. No, I was going to say Ross Green might say kids do well if they can. If they're not doing yeah, well, they have a skill to learn. And, and that's what we need to do. We need to think about how we can help people, not just always doing things to people. But on the de-escalation front, you, you really nailed it. And and that's been my experience as well, personally, and, and kind of doing this work, is that we find that very often it's a well-intentioned, but, you know, probably uh, not appropriately trained uh, adult that is escalating rather than de-escalating a situation. And Mickey Marinelli here, one of our, our friends here at the Alliance, brought up about not thinking you know, much of evidence that de-escalation techniques really work. Yeah. She mentions, uh, you know, um, SAMA, uh, which escalates her son because it asks so many questions. That's not de-escalation. Look, when I'll encourage Mickey about what we mean by our arousal approach, it means we do stuff to ourselves. We don't impose things on stressed people. You know, it's a bit like the classic analogy. Somebody's ready to jump off a building. Yeah. Imagine some of the so-called de-escalation programs that we know of in the industry. They wouldn't stand muster. Yeah. Right. I think you should come down. Right. Here's how <laughs> we're going to do this next. Here's your visual symbols. Yeah. I'll run around. I will impose myself on you. That doesn't work. And I think we've got to, and, and, and I think she, they're absolutely right, that we've got to start understanding Beth's point as well as that what we mean by de-escalation de is about person-centered de-escalation, humanistic de-escalation, not just a few tricks that people learn on these training courses. I remember years ago, um, somebody saying to me, well, for example, if you mirror someone's postures, <laughs> that calms somebody <laughs> down. There's some intuitive face validity to the statement, but no evidence worth a damn for these things. And actually, if I stand too close to you, which is evidence, I will increase your arousal. Fact. If yeah. I do anything that you perceive as threatening, I will increase your arousal. If I think about someone who's, who's hypervigilant, um, good de-escalation, and that's what we try to do in our model, and it's not the answer, is to say, what would you really do to calm a situation down. And actually most of the things you come up with are hard because they involve things that we should do, not the child. Mm -hmm. And it means, I need to take a step back now. I, I saw uh, one example recently in a school and I'll say roughly it was in Ireland. I was running a workshop. And you know, when you get a group that you know are engaged, they came from a specific school, it's about four years ago. They were really engaged until we got onto de-escalation. And I could notice their body language change completely. And the reason was I said about planned escape. And then I overheard the conversation and said, you can't use planned escape in your school. Did I say planned escape was let this child run out in the middle of the road in front of a lorry? Because now you're catastrophizing and you're coming up with nonsense 
they were a little shocked by the way they mm -hmm. weren't expected. i said i'm really fed up of this when there's a fire in your school what happens and they went well there's an area we go to i said so go there for de-escalation if you need to and he went yeah i said what you're doing is you're telling and setting up a straw man argument because you're scared that what you're saying is you want to change but when we suggest how you can do it in a simple way you don't like to hear that because you want loads more resources to make this change and sometimes it's small changes that can make a big difference like that right. and i think you're right again this theme i, I avoid the word de-escalation a lot in my written work on purpose even diffusion and defusion I couldn't make up my mind which was appropriate in the late 90s. <laughs> is it diffusing or is it defusing like a bomb? In the end, I just came up with a coward's way out and actually stopped using either word and said, we do a low arousal approach. So so let, let, let's talk about that. You know, so Beth had mentioned your book, The Reflective Journey, A Practitioner's Guide to the Low Arousal Approach. And you've mentioned some elements of low arousal, but but can you give us kind of the 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 elevator pitch for what is the low arousal method and, and how was this developed? It evolved. It came actually out of the training and my practice and my colleagues work. But actually, first of all, by watching people that I felt safe with. My very first mm -hmm. job as an unqualified person was in a behaviorally based unit. It was not a service. And we did some pretty pushy things with people in the 80s. You know, I, I squirted lemon juice in someone's mouth mm -hmm. twice. Never the third time. That was one of my big changes when I discovered the word no, even as a young psychologist in budding in the future i'm not doing this right but what happened was i started to first of all observe people and i'm a keen observer who are relaxed and calm and exude that i was also teaching a martial art and i still am not i keep my world separate but in my next book i'm trying to admit that i have two had two worlds and i thought it's quite a high level i'm a demigod in my martial art retired for many years <laughs> somebody says what's your title demigod <laughs> um uh, what rank is that we don't need to know the rank just a minor deity will do uh, and one of the things even in the martial arts world and i, I went some pretty impressive people who were very aware of themselves and self-aware the best practitioners were always calm always not escalating situations incredibly confident about their own ability sometimes overconfident and you wouldn't notice them in a the room so I tied that with my practice work and people I worked. So the first indicator was there is something in our characteristics that makes a difference, even down to working. And I don't want to take the analogy wrong, working with animals. Yeah. What do you do with this big dog that's there with teeth snarling? Yeah, you show it a card and you tell it to back off. No, you don't. Yeah, you, you're aware of that. What led on to this was I got very interested in some elements from a sciencey type of view. So one of them was about demand related challenging behaviors, which is well documented in the behavioral literature. Increased demands, you get more behavior. Very simple relationship. So in a crisis, demand reduction is what you should do. But what I see people do, first of all, I noticed in crisis in a nutshell was they don't stop the demands in a crisis. They keep mm -hmm. plowing on with it. It's a bit like the old joke about the Battle of Waterloo. The Duke of Wellington is alleged to have said the French came on in the same old way and we shot them down in the same old way to paraphrase it. So what we do when we're panicking is we carry on making demands to a kid and more demands to a kid and more demands to a kid. It's like we're stuck with a broken record. So we knew that demand reduction was part. The second part became my obsession, which was what we do particularly mm -hmm. makes a difference. So how we move, our postures, moving slowly, breathing slowly, things that they'll call mindfulness these days was a second element. The third element I did was about verbal, I hate the word de-escalation, but when in doubt, shut your mouth. All the best people I've ever worked with in crisis situations, they actually say less, not more as a general rule. They shut up. How many times have you seen people? They just can't be quiet. I did a training course once and I actually put gaffer tape around people's mouths. I wouldn't get away with it these days. It was meant as a joke. They now try for the next hour to communicate. Now we've done this. And I did it myself and I ripped it off after five minutes saying, this is living hell for me. But if you ask me to support someone in a crisis, I can do it. So it's a skill. So the last element, which we evolved was about the word cognitive, which is belief systems. So we put the last thing about our kind of reactive approach was you are challenging people's assumptions about behavior. And it's in the original articles I wrote. Um, very good colleague of mine, Roy DeVoe, who's an academic said, low arousal is like a slippery eel. I read five or six different interpretations written by you over the years. And I said, well, it evolves as a concept. He, ha he hates it. <laughs> 
And what you said in 94 was this. Yeah, well, this is 2020. And what we're saying is that bit about that reflected bit is actually the cornerstone. Now, what we can add on this, and I've got in my book, is there are drivers to this that also fuel into this. Understanding seeing stress, not the behavior. Understanding trauma. Yeah. Not seeing someone is in control of their behavior all the time. If you watch Nanny 911 and you really believe a nine-month-old baby is screaming to get you out of bed and has a purpose and a plan, you're on the wrong planet. And I, I used to call it North American something or other in terms of behavioral methodology. I don't anymore, Beth. But basically, <laughs> mindset that these kids are so smart and so intelligent in everything they do. They've got a plan for everything. Our rule is when we started looking at attributional research is the more stressed you become, the more you perceive someone as a threat, the more you perceive someone as controlling. So those cognitive elements are in my book now because I think they are quite important in terms of we're talking about changing perception as part of our approach. We're actually saying, well, I see you as a distressed individual, not a collection of behaviors that's going to harm me. I see you as someone traumatized, hence being trauma informed. Um, I used to hate the word meltdown. I love it now. I used to hate it when I was in my pseudoscience period. Oh, we can't use words like meltdown. Now I wouldn't use any other word because it actually depicts what we see sometimes. Sorry, that was nearly nine minutes, Guy, at least to explain a two-minute answer. So I apologize. <laughs> that was great. So I was going to ask for the elevator pitch, but we're just pretending it's a very long building. You it's, know? A, it's the Empire State Building. We're on the 100th floor now. That's right. Well, you, that, that long uh, description gave a, a long comment here. And uh, Jamie said, whatever model assigned, we must align human rights that involve a partnership that includes true person-centered approaches that are eclectic and that include ourselves in the process of co-regulation. As a person with life experience and a, as a professional in the field of uh, learning disabilities and autism, I feel that we can reduce slash eliminate seclusion restraint, but we must work on ourselves. And when I read that comment, of course, I thought about your book which on the back of the book talks about being person-centered approaches. Um, so it, it seems that, that comment really um, yeah. correlates well with your your it work. Of an unfair comment. I work with Jamie. He's a colleague. So okay. that's unfair <laughs> in, in, you know, that in North America. And I'll get you a drink for that. <laughs> like, like, when COVID allows us to meet in a field again. Okay? I, I, should, I should have known that it was a long comment. It was probably from Thank somebody you, Jamie. you knew. Bottom. <laughs> so I, I wanted to comment, um, and you know what, my brain just goes when it's here, uh, on, on the comment about assigning uh, motives to behavior. Uh, you were talking about the nine month old. And what I see is a big barrier, and I'm curious about whether you have the same kind of barrier um, in, in the UK, is that our uh, promoted quote unquote behavior management and behavior is a word I'd like to get rid of, behavior management. Um, but we weaponize the, it. You what? We weaponize the word behavior. Mm -hmm. Oh, we absolutely. So what I see is that the, um, the, the technical assistance is provided, the guidance and everything about um, strategies for having um, good school culture, safe school, a place where kids can learn, are assigning motives. They assign the motives mm -hmm. to, they assign intention and motives to every behavior. So if a child has issues at school, they get a functional behavior assessment, which will try to see what the function of that behavior was so that it can be addressed, that every behavior is either to get out of something or to get something or, or whatever, which is so far from the science now, but that is what our country is producing and teaching teachers. Like all good American ideas, you've infected the globe. So <laughs> one of the problems with that is that um, I've written an article which caused a little bit of trouble, but it was deliberate. Called, I've written it on my website and it's called uh, on Studio 3, which is I'm a behaviorist in recovery. Um, <laughs> now, I'm going to be writing some more, but I have to be very careful because um, what you're actually saying is I'm not demonizing anyone who's a behaviorist and I don't. Mm -hmm. But there is so much of this methodological nonsense out there that. Like, for example, I see a kid who's crying and upset. I sit down and ask him, why are you upset if I can? Or I put my arm around them. I don't go, I need to observe your behavior now for a few hours to figure out why you're, what your crying behavior is all about. There's a point at which the technology becomes like a cookbook. And that kind of methodological behaviorism I don't sign up to. The other thing as well is when someone is in distress, there's no learning going on. 
And, uh, mm -hmm. One of the biggest arguments we had in the early days of our training was people saying things like, you're saying to back off in a crisis, but that's reinforcing bad behavior. No, it's not. If you read Skinner, if you read the schedules of reinforcement, my usual answer was, you don't know what you're talking about, even from a behavioral point of view. Mm -hmm. What you're saying is a wish and a desire. Uh, some of the leading experts in my in my field in PBS that I've got time for, people like Gary Lavinia, who's, you know, Ann Donlan, people from the past that I'm fortunate they trained me. They all said a similar thing. Ted Carr, even a whole raft of names. They all said in a crisis, there's no learning going on. And I can show you documentary literature of all of them. So actually, those rules are out the window. So one of the first challenges is, you know, if I develop a proactive approach, which is highly demand related, but I'd use low arousal to calm you down after I've escalated it, then we're no further on. So I do think there is a there is an issue around the behavior narrative. There's an issue around empiricism. It is particularly bad. It's my experience in the US. But you know, um, I upset some people recently by saying, why do you need another profession? We always love professions. In the US, you love them. Why do you need something called a board certified behavior analyst? You know, what do you need these people for? What do you need psychologists for? You know, basically, we need to be careful that sometimes they're incredibly good. And I, I get into trouble on Twitter for this. They're incredibly good behaviorists out there. And they do exist. I know some of my colleagues from the lived experience community don't agree with that necessarily, but they do exist. And they're empathic individuals who usually are less obsessed about the technology. They might do a functional behavior assessment occasionally if it's the wind suits and I'm working with someone with a really complicated set of behaviors and I'm stuck, but they wouldn't be doing it as routine. And I think what people have confused is the methodology. What we found is that we can use the crisis management arguments to actually say, you, you're not reinforcing anything here. I mean, Laurie Desatels, and we just finished her book, actually. Thank you for that as well, guys. It's, a, it's been a joy to read. Hmm. You know, I'm a groupie. I've discovered me a few more people I can be groupies <laughs> of. I warned <laughs> the other day that, you know, once you get me as a groupie, you're that's it for life. Yeah. I'm just like that puppy you try to get rid of. You keep following <laughs> you around. Uh, and one of the things that she's talking about a lot of time is where discipline comes from alignment and it also comes from our past experiences. Mm. So this urge to discipline people also comes from our parents. You know, the number of times I've heard people misattribute intent to people all the time. Mm. You know, in my book, I call it the battle for control. It's perceived control, not actual control. You know, I perceive you as controlling. I perceive you as winning. And this is not some kind of Stepford Wives Handmaid's Tale novel. This happens in day to day practice all the time. So I often say to people, how do you know that? How, how do you know that? Well, he just knows. The way she looked at me the other day, she smiled like this just in the corner and she laughed as she walked away. She knows. Really? That's called nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> my problem, not hers. That's my, my, And I my would say the psychologist I adore the most, I'm going to say this guy is Albert mm -hmm. Bandura. He had this one phrase of the many things he said, which is all behavior is about perception. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I would hold your audience with. Um, nope. Regulate, Andrew. <laughs> I was just going to say, my, my, my son, my son, he's autistic, and, and he, when he would be distressed, he would sometimes smile and inappropriately, and people would always assume that to intent. Now, I knew not long after kind of understanding what was going on that that was an indication that he's having a hard time with something, but people would want to, you know, put it to intent. So let, let me move on for a second, because we've got a lot we want to talk to you about. I want to find out a little bit more about your work at Studio 3, what kind of services you offer at Studio 3, and and where you're, where you're practicing the low arousal approach okay. that you talk about. If we, do, we have two, uh, two arms. Originally, we started with our training, mostly in adult services, to be honest, first of all, mostly around the UK and Ireland. Uh, there's clusters in different places. In Europe, uh, we developed a large cluster in Denmark, where we've just had a recent evaluation. Um, Sweden, Germany um, are big clusters of our work in Canada. And for any of our Canadian colleagues, yeah, you've been a godsend. You've given me faith in North Americans. I'm sorry. I'm oh, sorry we that. don't? No, you do too. <laughs> But they were <laughs> my faith. Yeah. All right. We, we, we've got to end the interview Sorry. now. <laughs> Moving on that segue very quickly. I had to get at least one jibe in. But the thing is that uh, what happened was that we, we started in disabilities and autism services predominantly. Then it went to children and adults. It expanded in some areas, not others. In mental health, we had a lot of disasters because people found the message too hard, particularly around restraint elimination. But we've got little clusters of the work around that. It's a lot of work to be done for us in that. Uh, what you would call traumatized and looked after children, we do a lot of work there. But what happened is in about the mid-1990s, we started getting 
phone calls, usually they went like this. Your training doesn't work. I've got this kid. I did that. We danced around the room. Doesn't work. So we had this caveat that myself and my colleagues would come and visit those places because we felt obligated if we'd done the training. That turned into this beast called consulting. So our consulting organization complements our training organization. We don't have to, you don't have to have our consulting organization to do our training. Um, and an example has been COVID, which is the training company. We didn't have to furlough everyone. We were lucky for lots of reasons. Um, but we decided to retool our training over that period, do more stuff online for free. Uh, but our consulting organization, part of the organization actually increased hmm. formally. So we're kind of a, we are a company for controlling our intellectual property. As long as you'll say that, but we, we're not interested in making large profits. So our spread is still predominantly 80% of it is in the learning disabilities. Autism is probably 45% of the organizations that we support and work with both clinically in terms of training. Um, but the growing areas are children without any kind of pseudo label or real label. Um, and we try to work in an integrated way. So there are, there are quite a few organizations now over 50 at least to operate both our, if you like behavior clinical consulting model, with our training um, that those organizations, I think one of them, we've been working with them for 22 years. Um, and that's why I can tell you, I don't want to make silly claims here, but things like physical interventions are an incredible rarity. Mm. In fact, in one of those organizations, really a staff member did get hurt and it was a big deal for all of us. We were concerned about that member of staff because they have no experience of practicing even our Kung Fu, as we call it. Mm. Yeah, they, they've got, it's just not really part of the, of the conversation a lot of the time. So we, we kind of evolved in that way. And that's why the two things go hand in hand. Also, we called ourselves a training system because we don't just do training courses. It's a waste of time to do lots of training courses, pat yourself on the back and go home on a Friday night and say you've done a good job. Mm. If you're into organizational culture and change, you sometimes have to be an honest friend. And that's why we probably, guys, somebody said to me recently, we've done pretty well as an organization, but we probably could have been 10 times bigger if we chose to franchise our training. No. If we chose to basically just do training without engaging with organizations. And the third rule was we decided in this work that sometimes the customer's wrong. Yeah. And mm -hmm. we can't just accept every training request that comes in through the door because sometimes I've got to be careful what I see. Some organizations want us to sanitize what they're doing by saying, mm -hmm. hey, we've got Studio 3 in. And they're mm -hmm. doing that bit. But we're going to carry on with this. So it's kind of evolved. I So my work now is probably 80%. Uh, consulting with our team. We have a team of therapists, quite a lot of young psychologists who usually go on to be budding practitioners in the profession in the future, a hardcore team of uh, few psychotherapists, few psychologists amongst that. But we have a culture of trying to not be too, um, eh, what's an American term for it? Antsy. Mm -hmm. We're trying not to uh, have a, a professional group that all the people who work in my organization, they're real people and they can work on the ground if they have to. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes that surprises people. The joke in my organization is that nobody wants me to work in their organization anymore directly on the ground. I was talking to some colleagues actually in Ireland, if they're listening. And one of them said as a joke to a new member of staff, if we really have a problem, the last thing you want is him turning up at the house. <laughs> he will. And he'll eat food. He'll sit in his settee. He'll probably watch the TV. There'll be no issues with the service users because... They have fun and they relax and there's a bit of truth in it. And he's an absolute pain if we don't practice things and procedurally follow things. Mm -hmm. I still believe in that. So the approach is very much about how we apply that ethos. One of our most exciting projects is actually with foster families looking after looked after children. A colleague of mine for years did a little laboratory experiment where he took the principles of low arousal, added a bit of empathy and compassion on top, a little bit about trauma and decided to train foster families who motivation, as you know, for many foster families is not money. Um, and last year he presented the soft data, which absolutely terrified me because the project had gone really well mm. and he expected <laughs> my reaction to be, that's marvelous. I sat in a room thinking, we can't resource this. What have you done? You know, you're like children. You go off running away, playing in the playground. And you say, look what I've just produced, Daddy, an enormous project that we're now going to have to fund and resource for the next 10 years. But I'm actually delighted. So we've applied our work in schools for the same reason. We've got a program called the Laser Program, Lower Arousal Supporting Educational Resilience. There's a mouthful. But it's basically applying Lower Arousal to the classroom. And the real unique difference is my colleague, Gareth Maud, was a teacher. 
He speaks teacher. <laughs> it's a language. So I don't, I'm not completely fluent, Beth, in teacher. I'm kind of 80% there, but sometimes there's some linguistic barriers for me. You know, I don't necessarily so, so, so teacher brings me to a, good, uh, to a question, which is, you know, you talked about culture earlier. Now you're talking about, you know, in, in education. Of course, we do a lot of focus here on education, but we're, we're really concerned about restraint and seclusion wherever it might be used. But certainly a lot of the, the issues that we deal with are around these practices being used in our in our schools. And, you know, one of the things that I've found is that in schools, uh, they vary a lot and there can be cultures, there can be certain schools where the culture is restraint and seclusion. That's what they use. That is the the tool in their toolkit. And there are others that do much better things. Uh, so culture is always a hard thing to change. So I would ask you in, in kind of the training, you know, whether it's laser or bringing low arousal in, how do people react to that? And then how do you work to implement that change where you may have a resistant population at times? It's a really excellent question and i think one of the things i would say as well is is that the ideal which we don't always get is that you want to engage with an organization and see that their leadership principal at the school or others engage with the training if they don't want to do that that's a red flag for us i'm too busy no we're talking about culture change or we're talking about further emphasizing the good work that you're doing so we have to have engagement at that level. So we can we encourage the fact that our training should be stratified. You want people on the shop floor. You want people all across an organization doing it. But the leaders are really important. And I suppose if I'm being honest over the years, we probably weren't good enough in some of those areas with some organizations. Having said that, I work with some adults. So I've got to be very careful what I say here. I still have this um, uh, kind of predilection to i started off working in institutional environments years ago to close them and i think that sometimes um i quite like going into environments where people are hostile to low arousal there's a part of me that actually enjoys it now my colleagues don't all enjoy it i admit that um and in the last few years we've had a few change projects one which was linked to a, a national undercover documentary and i won't say where but Basically, they asked us to go in on the ground and it was four years of a nightmare. It was almost like, what's the argument going to be this week? But the numbers over time with persistence and resilience dropped. And I think what you're trying to do is bring some people on board. But there are some individuals and they're a small minority who are control freaks who contaminate this. If the head of a school or an organization is like that, then you can do as much training as you like. You're shoveling stuff sand against the waves i forgot north america and shoveling sand is what i said definitely shoveling sand <laughs> but that's exactly what you're doing and i think my one of the variables in that is that takes leadership so when you talk to people and say okay tell me not what the policy says what's your strategy around restraint reduction elimination in your school or service uh, if they can't answer that, then we get our red flags. Now, what I don't believe is we then just only work with the schools that are great because that doesn't move the agenda on either. Right, right. But, you know, if somebody challenges us to go work in some god awful hellhole with a remit and clear terms of reference and clear communication for a change project, we, we, we do accept those from time to time. But what I've learned in the last few years is we can't, as an organization, do too many of those at the same time um, because you do get emotionally stretched with it. I have a little joke. I went, it is an, oh, can I say this? I kind of can. I remember I was doing some training in a place um, where we we're going through the change process. They're still using seclusion, still do now actually, but very mm. minimal. We're getting there. Four years. They know who they are. They know you know who you are if you're listening to this. <laughs> but in the middle of the training process, somebody said the training is polarizing our staff. They've kind of been different, a lot of them, to the whole idea mm. of de escalation, low arousal. Now we've either got for or against it. There's nothing in the middle. It's a bit of a bit of analogy to what's happened in your politics, really, um, and ours, and a lot of other places. We're no better. But one of the things that was interesting about it was I was talking to some behaviour sports specialists, and a member of staff had their coat on because one of the plans was this is a crowded environment. Whenever somebody looks agitated, get them outside. I don't care whether it's rain or shine. We wrote it into their behaviour support plans. So that meant that staff had to, some staff who liked that thought it was great and other staff thought it was a real pain, you know, that they had to do this. So in the mix of this conversation, I heard somebody say under their breath deliberately so I could hear it as they're walking around. It was something low arousal. <laughs> and they said it again. 
And my colleagues from the service, one of them got up and I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm not having that. I said, we are making a great deal of success here because that person took the effort to give us that display outside of this office door. Yeah. I'll tell you one little joke. I've got to be careful. What I say is they have become quite a good proponent over the years. Now mm. worn them down is the joke that they actually said, you've worn us down you lot about lower arousal. Okay. I get it. And yeah, you're never going to bring up that time again. Well, anyone who knows me knows I'll wait my time, maybe another year when COVID's over, we're in a bar, I'll pick my moment and I'll say out loud, lower arousal. Eh? The point about it is, is that these are simple things you can do. Now that, that's an institution, for example, that's resourced badly. It's overstaffed. It's mm. horrible, the overcrowded environment, but we got an 80% audit reduction around restraint around high risk individuals. The environment's not changed. The staff haven't fundamentally changed, but the focus has changed. Mm. And, Sometimes this work does take years and I think it disheartens. We get a lot of the kind of hero innovators who want to charge in and change something overnight. Some of these places ain't like that. There are other places I've been involved with that I've been involved with closing them. And there are some places that are, they're a bit like a disease that are too far gone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're so entrenched in a model that they're never going to change. And you could waste millions of dollars trying to change them. Just open a place next to them with the same government funding with a different ethos. Try so, not to waste all the time on, on this. I know the argument that is often people are in quite abusive cultures and that, that I have zero tolerance for that as you probably are aware, really. So yeah. so as a related question to that, so understanding how, and I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, th these aren't things that go away overnight. It, it takes people moving in a direction and it takes some awareness. And, and you know, I mean, you know, we've, we've all talked about our own stories of when, you know, something kind of went off for us. But, you know, thinking not just about the providers, but the people that are impacted by these interventions, whether they be students in a school or, or people in a facility of some sort, um, how have you found that they've responded to this? Because a lot of times people are moving from, kind of co compliance and control based approaches into a different model. And, and I imagine, you know, due to the trauma and due to due to issues of concern and trust, it, it may be difficult. How do you find that people respond to it that are? Uh, well, I'm an, opt I'm an optimist guy in, in, in my book. I don't want to plug it but in my book. I'm trying to be very honest about the fact that I did start off in my work originally. I was a crazy radical behaviorist for at least mm -hmm. two years. And the reason for it was I started to start waking up myself to thinking, what am I doing? I'm writing prescriptions like a doctor would and calling them behavior support guidelines and management guidelines. And I, I'm an optimist. A lot of people, if they're honest, can turn around. The example I gave you is, you know, I'm ashamed of the fact that the first few times I was asked to squirt lemon juice in someone's mouth, but I did it. Hmm. I'm proud of the fact that I, it turned me into a, an assertive monster. And even at the time, I was quite assertive. So I felt doubly ashamed. Why didn't I speak up? Why didn't I just say, look, we're crossing a line here, guys? And I think what I've learned from it is, is that a lot of people can change, but it's not easy because you've got to be honest. And, and to be truly reflective, you've got to be open to that. And you've got to understand that we're fallible human beings. We're not perfect. Well, I'm not perfect. <laughs> my wife will tell you that right now before she plans to end my life anytime soon for being <laughs> sarcastic. In, I'm only kidding. She's a, she's a very long suffering. 30 years plus marriage. Yeah. Uh, four children plus me. So it's, it's, <laughs> quite, it's quite difficult for her. Uh, and one of the things that we joke about, but on the serious side with this is, is that to change, you have to say to that individual, do you feel comfortable about the things? And often when I'm working in cultures around restraint, not everyone does feel comfortable. Mm. One little thing I checked tonight, I published a pedestrian article in 1996. It's actually one of the first articles on seclusion elimination. It was mm. published in a nursing journal in the UK. It was a case study. I worked there. It was a ward. The hospital policy said we had to use seclusion. No, we didn't want to do it. So what we did was we took the door off of the seclusion room and hid it. <laughs> with the board manager's approval, leadership, with my approval. No one asked us, gave us permission to do it. But we did discover, he's long since dead now, so I could say it, that the my spies in the institution told me that um, it was still being used. Mm. A guy was blocking the door, one of the night staff. So our next idea was to buy a small gym, tiny, that was really heavy, and we put it in there. And then we heard... And it doesn't go in the article, but the article just says we eliminated restraint, seclusion from this place, was that we discovered that that same member of staff 
was so passionately frightened that we'd taken away his survival blanket that he put his back out trying to remove the gym one night at the start of his shift. Mm. So he was off sick for four months because he slipped a disc trying Mm. to lift this heavy device out of the room with a friend. What we found was we said, we'll only trial it in this one area, but it was the only area in the hospital that still used seclusion. So actually, when we wrote it up as a case study, I remember getting feedback from colleagues saying, rubbish. No, that's all we did. We just agreed. We're not going to do this. Yeah, we know the the hospital policy oh, can, It's closed now, so I can say this took four years to change. But we had already eradicated seclusion. Mm. But they still needed another four years of committees and specialist groups oh to figure out when to decommission the room, which no longer existed. So one of the things that we've got to understand is, is that these are people's security blankets. And right, right. when we're looking at this, I don't buy into the argument that seclusion is nice, restraint, less nice. You have to get someone into a seclusion room. And in my experience, they don't walk in there freely and willingly. In the UK at the moment, we discovered a counting error that the Department of Health was classifying seclusion as separate from restraint. So they weren't summating the numbers. Mm. So, you know, they would say we had 8,000 seclusions in mental health services in a year, as an example slightly higher than that but we only had 16,000 restraints well actually all the seclusions involve restraint bar about two but you've classified them as something different so you've actually reduced your restraint level by one third by stupid accounting so that's changing now because again it was uh, that actually wasn't even malevolent Mm. the word I would use for it was um stupid Mm -hmm. yeah we've often questioned that as well that uh, you know we'll often see data that indicates that uh, there are fewer restraints than seclusions at times. And, 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 you know, we always ponder how you can possibly put someone in a room or space against their will without having to previously restrain them. I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense that if and truly it is against their will, how you, how you get them there. Um, seems like the two always need to be connected. And the term is it's disingenuous. Often right. when we look right. at methodologies and what people publish, it, it's actually nonsense. You know, I remember my very first conference I went to was in Paris in 1990. I was talking about the social validity of restraint, my first big deal, big audience, great food, good wine. And there was an American psychologist in the audience who tried to tell me that they used a buzzer system in his institution and people walked in when they heard the buzzer. It was conditioning. Mm-hmm. And um, I avoided him for the rest of the conference. He eventually came up to me and said, I enjoyed your presentation, but you clearly are very young and you don't really know what you're talking about. That's the paraphrase, the essence. He was politer than that. And I said, so you just press a buzzer like in a Skinner box and then somebody walks in. You clearly have not worked on the shop floor in your life. So I suggest we don't talk anymore because I've never heard so much nonsense in my life. If you believe in Walden 2, it's the wrong novel to read. The bottom line here is, is that often when people suggest these things, let me give you an example of something I really hate. I hate the word trauma in how it's used by some professionals. You're broken. You're damaged. I'm going to mm-hmm. fix you. Mm-hmm. I'm going to give you trauma therapy. Mm-hmm. Why, why do we have to weaponize everything? We're obsessed with turning everything into therapy. Social stories are not a weapon. They're a way of communicating with people. Right, right, right. I was in a service a few years ago and somebody said, we read the social story. And I read this thing. I know Carol Gray. She'd have gone crazy if she would just heard that that was these are people that have been trained. And it was basically sometimes you do this, this happens. Sometimes you do that, this happens. And sometimes if you do this, really bad things are going to happen to you with an image. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. I had to explain to them under the definition of social stories from Carol, that's not a social story, right? That's just a way of weaponizing it and frightening a kid into doing what you want. And there was a picture of a policeman on it as well. And a policeman will come to your class and picture an image of an angry face. It was like, what are we doing? We're taking some of this technology and we're shaping it to our own attitude and desires. And, There is an issue here. There is a clash of cultures. You've had it, and it does fit down the lines again about the kind of tough love, tough mother, tough parent, or you're a bad parent, of course. That's the other thing people like to say all the time. You know, I think I'm a really good parent because I've been absent most of my kids' lives, and they've grown up really, really well. And I think they've had a certain amount of their father, but not too much. You know, and that's the argument I use to people. It's been a good cocktail in this house. I told Guy a funny story, and I will say it on Facebook. I remember arguing with my son, who's now a doctor. I can't even remember what the argument was about. He was about 15. A parent thing. You know, when you want to control your kid, you can't even remember what the argument's about. You just want to win the argument. The guy wrote a book, wrote a book on lower arousal. And all I remember, in the middle of this argument, my son picked up my first book, The Academic Tone, 
called manage aggressive behavior in care settings. Yeah. yeah? Applying the low rouse approach. And he held it up in front of my face and said, have you ever read any of this? <laughs> oh. It was the best put down I've experienced in years. I stood there going, you what? What did you just say? Have you read this? Within five minutes, I'd rationalized that to a glass of wine saying, that's my boy. He'll go far. Yeah, the brain there. But the real argument was we're not paragons of virtue. If we can be honest that we're not perfect. I'm one of the most, a colleague said recently, you're kind of like Mahatma Gandhi with a baseball bat. And I took that as a compliment. He said, you've got the pacifist stuff, but in the right circumstances, you kind of get really annoyed. What I get annoyed about is the fact that we are in this together and we right, have right. to call out. We do have to call out bad practice. Mm -hmm, we do mm -hmm. have to do developmental things and we have to be honest. I mean, mm -hmm. my article that I told you about, Beth, I got a slating from one person who, on social media who said, you clearly don't understand Skinner. What I wanted to text back was, go boil your head. You can't do that. You can't. You don't role model someone else's bile by doing it back yourself. Mm -hmm. My argument was, why is this person so angry? And they're angry because it's challenging some very core beliefs that they right. have. Right. I'm not saying every behaviorist in the planet should be executed, but I'm saying the methodological types, they have no place. They're dinosaurs. They will mm -hmm. be eradicated mm -hmm. eventually. We will look at them in 165 million years time and say, who are these people? What did they do? Why did they weaponize behavior all of right. the time? Right. So I think you do put the things together. And that's why the lower arousal approach for me, it is, I don't like the word philosophy because it started off as a set mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. de-escalation strategies, but there are a lot of philosophical underpinnings of pacifism and nonviolence in what we do. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you make no bones about that. And, you know, you start by saying, well, you're not going to put that person on the floor again. I can't just expect by regulations you stop doing that. I have to teach right. you some alternatives. Otherwise, right. I'm just as dumb as the last person who's walked in and identified a problem. Yeah. And that's that's where this all started and evolved. And, you know, there's so much more to learn. I learned so much from you talked about people with lived experience of all kinds. You know, you know, one of the phrases I learned as a young psychologist was never tell someone you understand unless you've experienced what they're experiencing. Never use the word. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I was a young psychologist. I remember working with a very famous cognitive therapist who took me around with him to show me how good he was. And he kept on saying to this person who was suicidal, I understand, I understand. We got back and said, what did you think of that? And I said, have you ever tried to kill yourself? Um, it's the lowest grade I got right, in my right, entire right. professional training, right? It was a low grade. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My other supervisor said, I don't want to know the details, but you've clearly upset our colleague. Mm. I said, well, I just don't like the word I understand. Right. I try to understand. I empathize with you, but I'm not you. Right, right. And it's arrogant of me to assume that. And so when we talk about empathic approaches, I want to finish an example. My colleague, Damien Milton in the UK, who I adore his work, he talks about double empathy. And double empathy isn't just an idea in autism. It's an idea in all our fields. What we're teaching people around de-escalation, low arousal, is to empathize with that person. That's not a piece of meat. That's a human being. And how would I really want to be treated myself if I was that distressed, yeah, drowning? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah? I'd right. want someone to help me. What I wouldn't want is someone to tell me what to do. Mm -hmm, and I mm -hmm. think that's the essence of it. And I think... You know, understanding behavior, understanding perception, seeing that we're fallible, that's the other part of this. And there are loads of good practitioners of this approach. We've never been taught by us. We didn't invent nonviolence. Mm. Suddenly one day on a rock. I think we did quite well with the term, low arousal approach. But this argument is as old as the Bible and before. Mm. About spare the rod, not the child. Right, about the right. beliefs that we have as people. And that's become an even bigger part of mm -hmm. what we do but mm -hmm. for young staff in services why i still believe in better training in that that middle bit around de-escalation is it gives them confidence and confident people make better decisions they get less stressed they stop personalizing things right. and right. they become a little bit more chilled right you know right. you know i wonder in the future a service where we can give all the medication to the staff and leave it alone <laughs> from the service users you know hey you're all going to take a shot today of respiridal Mm -hmm. right it's going to take the edge off the day and your form filling will be a lot easier i say it as a joke as a parallel but the example is we are looking at the wrong people's behavior right, right. i want to be careful i'm not blaming everyone it's not a blame narrative right, right. it's science 
we are part of an interaction. Stress is contagious. Emotions are contagious. Fear yeah. is contagious. Right, right. So you need to get people to reflect on that. And, and it's actually very difficult for some people. They don't really want to focus on that because it's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I keep telling people now, we're only as good as the last situations that we've managed. Never mind about your history and your track record. Mm. You know, I could equally be in our food queues in a supermarket in a few weeks' time and blow everything, all right? That's a joke, by the way. You know, <laughs> nearly did a few weeks ago. I can't stand rudeness when people are being rude and bullying other people. I don't really respond well to that. I'm, I'm not. <laughs> really, are you rude are you back? No, I'm just kidding. I, I do. I do have a question about um, yeah. the. I'm going to come to the United States once you've um, got rid of your. Um, what does it call it? COVID. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think that'll be a while. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll save my joke for that. So I, I want to go to so, places like Minnesota, North Dakota. Texas. Come to Richmond. Richmond. I've been Virginia. to Virginia. Nice place. Virginia. It's quite a nice place. Yeah, Virginia. Yeah, it's all right. It's yeah, quite okay. nice. All right. So I wanted to ask you a question about um, parents. And before I ask the question, <clears throat> I came to this originally as a parent of kids who struggled. Um, and but I also have a background in developmental services and uh, disability. <clears throat> but um, one of the things that I struggled with as a parent was um, feeling like and this may have been just me unique, uh, but feeling like I was being judged as a parent and I better do this. It didn't feel right, but this is what people were expecting me to do. Got a lot of bad advice, had done a lot of things I wish I hadn't done in my life. Uh, but the, the experts were advising, yeah. um, you know, this stuff. And, and I wonder as we look at, so, so I have really two questions. One is, does your, um, I, I, yes. right, see, I told you about this before that I, go off on different tangents. But um, I think parents are under uh, utilized and under included in being the solution to the problem. Yep. And so one of my questions was, um, do you include specific training for parents we're, or do you include we, we them have, in we have, we have both worlds. Okay. We have, where people are not comfortable being around other individuals. And of course, there's low arousal training solely for parents. And that's usually okay. when people are not feeling listened to. Often, mm -hmm. where possible, we want that led by parents or people with lived experience rather than people like me. Um, our laser school program, my colleague Gareth, a little anecdote on it recently. Uh, he got asked by a school, can we include the parents on this program? And his words to them was, it says it's a holistic approach. Mm -hmm. I hope you understand that this should be open to all the parents in your school doing this program. It's about encouraging dialogue rather than mm -hmm. experts by experience. And that doesn't mean to say that every parent is right. It doesn't mean to say that every educator is right. But yeah, I mean, I discovered in the crisis management field, we were doing all this wonderful training for organizations and parents and families didn't get anything. That's why most of the training we do for families is, is pro bono, because I'll be honest, in, in the UK, particularly there and Ireland, there is no money. We have to subsidize it. And that's fine. That's part of our, our mission. We can't subsidize the world. But you start with that premise. And also from a crisis management point of view, if you're a parent with a kid in a school who has challenges, yeah, you want to know what sort of stuff mm -hmm. people are being taught. You want to experience it. You want to be their critical friend. You know, we can't compartmentalize it and say, this is our training. You make do at home. Mm -hmm. Do your own thing. So absolutely. And I think increasingly over Thank the next you. few years, we're going to be really making things there's a colleague of mine linda woodcock she wrote a book called managing family meltdown with another colleague of mine andrea page and it's written particularly for parents it's one of the reasons why um i struggled to write a practitioner book because um they'd already written one and i think it's still in print and i'll, I'll put a signpost back on our website again because mm -hmm. again these ideas come from listening to families and also people listening to people with lived experience right, right and right. you don't develop trust by saying you know i'm going to sanction you it doesn't yeah, make me a hippie exactly you know the way i always started off with this is really simple beth if you did those things to me what would i do mm -hmm. right and i suppose mm -hmm. to say why the crisis management thing is like this i remember I remember going on a training course many years ago and um, somebody was hurting my arm. They put my arm in a locking movement like this and the instructor told me he wasn't hurting me. And I said, you're hurting me. And he said, no, I'm not. It's because you're moving. <laughs> That's why you're hurting yourself. And I said, no, you're, you're actually hurting me. And this carried on and on and on. And I just said to him, I'm asking you politely and respectfully, let go of me now. 
He went, well, what are you going to do about it? I said, something <laughs> that we're both going to regret. Mm. And he got up and he said, you threatened me. I said, you've just nearly broken my arm. And by the way, I'm actually here because my name's Andy McDonald. I'm a director of an organization called Studio 3. And I've heard a lot about your training from staff. And I just thought I'd come and sample it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I wouldn't do that anymore. I'd be too scared. You know, my biggest yeah. claim to fame was I did a low arousal training event in, in Tel Aviv in Israel. Mm. Trust me, if you can do our kind of training anywhere in Israel, it was a totally bimodal audience by the end of the night. They were either for or against us around the whole concept. And I met some fantastic practitioners there, as well as individuals who unfortunately were the stereotype. And I think mm. our job is to challenge that. It doesn't mean to say that some parents aren't like that as well. Some parents can be incredibly controlling, some less controlling, some individuals can only see the world from their point of view. But mm. we don't get anywhere unless we involve everyone in the conversation. So when we were talking about yeah. training in the US, we want people with lived experience to evolve and develop the training. But we don't want to be pejorative about it and say, hi, hi, Beth, you're now our token parent. Hello, you, you're now our total lived experience person. That's not how we work or roll. But yes. Well, and one of the things I have to say that you've said a number of times during this is that you make it okay to admit that you've made mistakes. Oh. And every parent, I can't think of a single parent who doesn't make more mistakes than they'd ever want to count. And it's hard to learn if you're feeling like you have to uh, protect yourself. Yeah. And um, so you do that so well. Uh, and I think it's really a lesson to all of us. I, Mona, did you meet Mona Delahook? Yeah, she I haven't your, met her yet. Yeah. I've read her stuff. Yeah. Yeah, uh, she's another one. But both of you do this thing of saying, it's okay. We all have learned. We've all made mistakes in our life. And I think that's such a key to being able to learn and do something differently. And it's the so other thank side you. Of I have to tell you that uh, when my kids were younger, we used to joke that we were the parents from hell when we go to their school. Um, because we were. You what know, did you do? We would we would just ask lots of very very probing questions, you know. Um, you know, what are you doing now? What are you doing with this? What are you doing with that? What's what, what's your approach to dyslexia? What's your approach to this? Um, and one of the head teachers said afterwards, he said, "I don't mean parents in hell in a negative way, but <laughs> we don't exactly let us off much." And my son, who was dyslexic, he's now an adult, and he's done really well. I remember having an issue about our a teacher telling me when he was quite young, "We're not a dyslexia specialist school." He, they didn't know what I did for a living. And I just said, oh, okay. And they said, so um, he might be better off in a school that caters more for dyslexia. I said, uh, okay, All right. And they went to say the third thing. I said, you need to stop right now because you have just walked into a huge gaping hole. Actually, my wife is more angry than I am. And by the way, um, how many kids you got with a diagnosis of dyslexia in this school? And she went, well, if my son comes here, I understand it's going to be nine. So... Why don't you tell me about what you do with them? I just joined the, I can say, I became a governor at that school. Mm. And the head teacher, who was fantastic, said, promise me one thing. You will never be the governor with an interest in special needs, as there is breath in my body. You will be <laughs> the worst nightmare on planet. But I'd like you to be in charge of the curriculum because you like numbers. Fantastic school, fantastic ethos. But... What we have to say is that we were lucky, middle class parents. We could have the time to do those things. And I think mm. sometimes, you know, we've gone to this them and us culture. You've experienced it. And I'm going to say this without joking in the US. We know that human nature is actually about division. It's about them and us. It's about mm. the other people. You, you've experienced it in your election. We've had it here, you know, as I keep telling mm. people all the time. You know, you can tell which way I would vote on something because my parents were Irish and I'm the son of immigrants. Simple as that. I don't need to say anymore. Yeah. I don't see somebody coming across the channel in a boat as someone that we should turn back. We're one of the wealthiest countries mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. Stop it. But that value base is about the fact that we have to break down these barriers. And sometimes we need to do that with individuals and families. Guy, you asked me a question early on about how people receive this. If there's one group of individuals that I found incredibly supportive of our approach, it's actually people with lived experience on the autistic mm -hmm. spectrum. Mm -hmm. Not everyone. A huge number of people who who tell us that they think what we're doing is, is that's where I heard about you. Yeah, and, and I've heard I've heard the right. same. So yeah. um yeah, there's definitely definitely a lot of respect for the work that you're doing. I'd rather be stereotyped by that group. 
<laughs> so we, we're getting at about the point where we're we're beginning to run low on time. So I want to take a moment to remind people really? that are hours guy. I've got hours. <laughs> 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 uh, so I want to remind people that if you're watching uh, and you have a question, we've got a few more, um, a little bit more time for a couple more questions. So if you have any questions, put those in the chat and, and I'll kick off with another question. And um, so you mentioned earlier, you, you let something slip out. And I said, I might ask you about this if it's OK. And that is that you're working on another book. Yeah. Um, can you tell us what you're working on, what it's about and when you think it'll yeah. be out? Well, I found out today it's written in the same style as the previous book. It's very personal and it's called, it's actually about the whole Studio 3 approach, which I've always avoided writing about. You know, we're kind of, somebody said once, you can't actually get a lot of, the Studio 3 company and approach, you read your website and you think you've understood it. And then you realize some areas are deliberately vague. And the most deliberately vague area is how do we reduce physical interventions? What do we do in that area? Restraint. So it's a companion book to the first book. I basically, all the bits that uh, I wanted to focus on was about what's our philosophy, what do we actually teach, put it all in the public domain. So that was the attempt. So basically, it's called Restraint and Seclusion Elimination, uh, the Studio 3 approach. I, so, I, like, I like the title already. <laughs> well, it was originally just going to be Restraint Elimination because we have less seclusion in some places. And then I realized, actually, even talking to you guys and others, yeah, well, it's all, to me, it's, it's the same old nonsense in a wrapped in a different kind of label so let's mm -hmm. include both so the idea of the book is is um i will be talking about our rationale i will be putting things on the public domain i've spoken to all our senior trainers most of them are on board with this a couple of them think we're crazy um a lawyer wants to make sure i don't libel anyone and so <laughs> all the examples in there are real but i think very cleverly anonymized by one of my colleagues because it is about that practice. I was just writing a section today on why we don't teach anything about taking weapons off people. Point one, it's a dumb thing to do. Point two, I spent years of jumping around in Japanese suits and gymnastics, and I wasn't very good at it, even with a martial arts demigod title. So we still <laughs> convince people on a training course that they can do that after a couple of sessions, like it's a Monty Python sketch. Mm -hmm. Point three, you do have the cops for a reason, although I accept, you know, what we need to do is to make sure that there are limits to training. So that's what I was writing about actually today. Um, and I know somebody said to me as an example, have you ever been threatened by someone with a knife? Several times. And each time I um, peed my pants in different contexts. Okay. Wasn't pleasant. It's not something that I actually ever want to encounter again. All of those were distressed individuals in my entire career. And not one of them, not one of them ever made me feel that my life was at risk. It was mostly people saying, I can't cope. So that book will hopefully, it will have some pictures in it. I'm very averse to that. You see all these kung, bad kung fu manuals out there with, this is our new technique and this is what we do. But I'm going to explain the whole rationale of why we do what we do. And mm -hmm. that does mean movement, science, kinesthetics, the whole idea of being in that space and breathing. And I, and I think looking at the draft today, that it does make sense. It's a companion book. It's not the sister book. It's a companion book. And after that, I'm thinking about writing something about the behavior support industry, but I probably need to officially retire before I do that. <laughs> the the yeah, lawyers but, are going to have fun with that one, I think. Yeah, I want to travel around the world. I don't want to be harangued at every airport. You know, a couple of them will do. But the point about is that that book is to complement it. And it's what we're going to be doing even more because we're a relatively small organization. I think we've had a fairly reasonable impact over the years. We're going to put more and more of our things in the public domain. Right. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is we're going to challenge other training organizations to do the same. I know how low our injury data is on training. I get to see the returns. Really, I get to see them. I also know that's not true for a lot of organizations out there. I don't even know how they get insured. Some of these organizations, you have people hurt on training courses, people, you know, literally feeling uncomfortable and getting injured. And as I said, our challenge, and I'm putting it in the book, is the sanitized training, which you might as well just give people a novel to read and just say, read that, because we're actually not going to do anything that causes any slips or falls on this training course. But when you go out into the real world, you won't have a mat that we've taught you. You won't be doing it calmly, and you will hurt that child, almost certainly, because your training is not fit for purpose. So it's about making training less common but better but much less common than it is now. And, and my message is 
better prevention, but better de-escalation training. Why don't we have de-escalation excellence badges? That's why I've said to you and your colleagues that you guys are experts by lived experience. I can't think of better people to introduce the concepts of low arousal to because you're living it. And so, yeah, you guys should be people training in de-escalation excellence. How many times do you hear, well, we've had a, a restraint with a kid and we're having more restraints. What we need to do is a de-escalation excellence program. No, what you hear is, Let's teach them more Kung Fu to these teachers or staff who are frightened mm -hmm, and scared. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of crazy paradigm. So I hope to address some of that in the book. As I said, there will be at least two lawyers looking at it before it's published. And I hope the target date to publish it is January 2021. So it'll be, it'll be great for you guys because you'll probably be in lockdown. Yeah. Yeah, we will. <laughs> um, also, don't, don't joke about these things. I think one of the things is that, you know, there's a lot of good that's come out of COVID-19, not all just bad. And I just hope we keep the momentum going with it. You know, mm -hmm. I've discovered I have neighbours where I live. I didn't really realise they existed really for quite a few years. And I'm ashamed about that. As you can see, I'm a fairly social guy. And in the summer, to finish with, one of our neighbours was sitting outside under the rules with a glass of wine in the middle of the, you would call it the sidewalk. And uh, he said, I've lived here 25 years and I didn't even, I used to see you drive off in your car early in the morning. We didn't know what you guys did. Um, and I apologized to him and said, I'm really sorry. I work in human services. I'm a quite social guy, but not when I get home, obviously. When I get home, my world changes to this context and nothing else. Um, and I've discovered he's got very good red wine. So he's actually contacted me again saying, when the rules are restricted to level 2.4703, <laughs> that means we can go and sit out on the sidewalk in the winter, keeping our social distance with a decent bottle of red wine. I'll supply the glasses. You learn to connect with people and you learn that, you know, there's seen so many positive things about this in terms of people taking socially distancing, taking a step back from people in psychiatric wards. It's not all bad, but there's some real learning here that mm -hmm. we've really got mm -hmm. to process over the next few years. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. like I said, with you as an organization, I want to be clear, you know, it's a joy that we found you and some other organizations like you, and we will be supporting you as much as we can. Right, while well, there's breath Thank in our body, and that's especially when, with campaigns about you, it is about elimination. It's not about reduction. I'll that's fantastic. Yes, that's fantastic. Yeah, uh, 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 um, yeah, that's not an argument. That's not a goal. Wh wh a while we're on that note, uh, you mentioned kind of giving some materials away. Um, you know, you you had given us the ability to give away a few of copies of your ebook. Um, yeah. Would you Would you mind if we gave a few away to people in our audience that are interested? Of course you can. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. So I'll I'll share with my you my email address, and if you're interested they, in getting they a copy, you, right? and they say they want a copy, yep, your group is lived experience, then you can contact. We'll, we'll issue yep. you some. Yep, emails. sounds no sounds great. Yeah, I, th I think we're good on having a number of licenses already. So we'll we'll, we'll have people. It, 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 excellent. excellent. If the only way I, I can get people to read my book is to give it away. Then I'll do more of that. It's okay. <laughs> you know, my ego my ego can't stand my book not being read. So. Yeah. Well, we'll help with that. We we want to help with your ego. So. <laughs> oh, that's great. So we, we we are just about at time, but I always leave one last question for Beth. Now I've got to be careful because Beth has figured out how to pack about six questions into her final question. So Beth, you are allotted <laughs> one final question here. All right. So I'll do one question, but I'm going to do one huge thank you for us. Thank oh. you for what you have done, what you continue to do. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. And my question is, um, we do have a lot of people with lived experience. A lot of, uh, we have, I think, close to 10,000 people who want to make a difference, who want to have, and who just, I heard today on an earlier thing, see, here I go again, um, that being an advocate was synonymous with banging your head against the wall. The two were synonyms. Um, what has been your most successful way of getting across this way of interacting with people who are having a difficult time struggling with their behavior? It's a hard question. I think I can't, to encapsulate it simply, it's about being real and authentic, you know, uh -huh. taking off your tweed jacket, going out and talking to people who, all people who are stressed and scared, go and walk a mile in someone's shoes if you can. That breaks down the barriers. Right. Mm -hmm. And also let people see you screw up. Yeah. <laughs> I remember a final story years ago when I did the early training. I was really into teaching people crisis strategies. And I worked with a speech and language therapist. And we took a guy with autism out for a walk. We were near a canal. 
His mother told us he liked water. She forgot to tell us he doesn't like canals. We don't know why. Probably it was the smell. And he got very upset. And in the midst of this process, he was holding my hand. He squeezed it. And when he gets upset, he used to bite his own hand. But my hand was covering his. So I remember seeing my hand go up to his mouth. He bit it very, very hard. I... And then my colleague said afterwards, weren't you supposed to do some fancy arm movement thing? And all I could say to her was, yes, I'm sorry, I froze. And mm -hmm. actually, look what happened when I froze. He calmed down really rapidly. So actually, it was one of the first bits of pivotal learning, which is less is more as a principle, minimal in intervention, actually allowing people to regulate that to me is the key. We don't give people a chance to learn to regulate because we start regulating them like we're weaponizing it. And that, that would be my answer to this. Um, Thank you. And I, and I would certainly say, honestly, it's been a privilege and a pleasure to talk to you guys. And obviously, I'm really enjoying this. Oh, thank you as well. ABA PBS controversy. Yes, thank you as well. <laughs> you support recently as well. You know what I mean by that. So we just got to keep on. Absolutely. Yeah, th this is this has been great. Yeah, I mean, it was su such a privilege to get to meet you and, and have a number of conversations with you. And you really appreciate the support for the work that we're doing. And, and you know, this is all about us us coming together, all, all of us that are interested in a positive change. And it's been such a, a, a great opportunity to to connect with you. And and I want people to know that are watching. This is a start. Um, you know, we've got more more things planned to to work with Professor McDonald and uh Really excited about it. Kevin Costner, if you build it, they will come. <laughs> that's yes. right. That's all right. <laughs> you know, you've already started base building the baseball pitch. We're there. Okay. That, and that's right. There'll be lots of conversations. There'll be lots of debate. Hopefully, your members will be irritated with me in about a year or so, saying, Can we just have the other guys? Not Andy. He's just all over the place. You know, but <laughs> <laughs> oh, We're insane. <laughs> Exactly, Beth. We're I'll be all over the place with you. Absolutely. We're all butterfly brains deep down. It's great. <laughs> it's honestly, it's been a privilege. And what I would say as well, um, I wanted to say hydroxychloroquine doesn't work. Mm. Neither does this for COVID, but I think it's really effective. <laughs> you, you know, you, you could have sent a bottle. You know, we could have we could have each had a bottle virtually here, you know. Y yeah, but obviously. <laughs> The sensory experiences I'm going through here now, I just can't convey to you, but it's, it's you know, it's been good. It's been uh, somebody good. asked for contact details, and uh, I know we put up the Studio 3 yeah, right. web address earlier, so um, studio3.org. Um, you can find contact details on there. You can ring my colleagues. We have a decent admin service. Uh, the reason why we do that is because we do get swamped, but we will respond to you if you, if you, if you contact through our system, okay? We Super. Will Super. Well, I've got a couple of announcements, but I will I will let you go. And, and thank you so come. much, uh, Andy. Build really appreciate it. If you build it, we will come. Watch That's right. I, I'm going to hold you to it. I mean, you know anything you promised me in a, in a butterfly moment, I'm going to remember. I, be, I believe I've been invited to Virginia here. So, you know, you shouldn't make what? statements like that. First chance I get. Don't you worry. All right. That's right. That's right. We'll, we'll have Beth... a General Lee statue together. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Uh, Beth, thank you as well. Um, uh, uh, okay. Privilege as always. And uh, I'm going to just um, thank you and, and, and send you guys on your way and give a couple announcements. So thanks again. Thank you. All right. So uh, just a couple quick announcements. I hope you guys enjoyed today's um, uh, interview. Uh, really great to have Dr. Uh, Professor McDonald here. And I just wanted to mention as well that we have more great programs coming up. We're continuing to do these every two weeks. Uh, and we have, again, in two weeks, we have a very special guest. Uh, we have uh, Ron Garrison, who is a specialist on uh, school safety, has also been an expert witness and a high school teacher. And he's very uh, knowledgeable about uh, civil litigation regarding restraint and seclusion. So Ron will be on um, in two weeks, uh, let's see, December 3rd, to talk to us. Uh, and uh, we will have this available to watch as a recording on YouTube or Facebook. And of course, you can always listen to it as an audio podcast. So I want to thank everybody again for being part of this. And uh, we really appreciate the amazing community that we have out there trying to affect change. So thank you so much. And we will see you again next time.